Welcome everyone to this, another installment in the Alliance for Community Trees webcast series. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'll be uh, hosting uh, this session and um, very, very excited to have everyone on. A few people are still joining us. Um, really excited to present this session this afternoon. The Alliance for Community Trees webcast series is a monthly webcast held at the lunch hour. The trainings leverage local successes by amplifying to a larger audience two model organizations' methods, materials, and approaches. Sessions are planned to last no more than one hour, with two presenters speaking on the same topic from slightly different perspectives each for about 10 to 15 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. This session is being recorded. This is a program of Alliance for Community Trees, or as we like to, to call it, AC Trees, the only national nonprofit dedicated to serving grassroots organizations and municipalities that plant and care for trees where over 90% of Americans live, in cities and towns. If you haven't already, definitely renew your membership for the 2014 calendar year. And uh, it's important to definitely renew now if you haven't already so that you can reap the many benefits of membership AC Trees provides. Head over to actrees.org and click the blue join us button to go ahead and renew if your organization is not yet a member or isn't up to date with their membership. On to the session. Today's session manage, is Managing Invasive Plants and Pests. The many benefits we enjoy from urban trees, including air, improved air quality, safer streets, and stormwater management, all depend on urban tree health. Increased human mobility and climate change are threatening the health of our urban forests, leaving many native trees susceptible to invasive species and pests. Environmental organizations at all levels are taking clear action to address these potential dangers. Canopy assessment is often the first step, guiding grassroots organizations, municipalities, and citizens to establish initiatives to protect their trees from further harm. Pest awareness campaigns, identification tools, and volunteer invasive removal training are proving to have a measurable impact on canopy health in several cities across the country. And we are excited to hear first from uh, the folks at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Rachel Holmes is the conservation coordinator for the Nature Conservancy's Forest Health Program, working primarily on the Conservancy's Healthy Trees, Healthy Cities Initiative. She develops and offers training on educational tools for tree health monitoring and yearly pest detection designed for various audiences. She maintains her tree planting skills by coordinating tree plantings nationwide and teaching proper planting technique. Prior to joining the Nature Conservancy, Rachel coordinated urban forestry-based youth development programs for Groundwork Bridgeport and Solar Youth Incorporated. She also served as the volunteer coordinator in the state of Connecticut's Urban and Community Forestry Program. Rachel holds a Bachelor's of Science from Rutgers University, a Master's of Forestry from the Yale School of Forestry, and a Master's of Divinity from the Yale Divinity School. And we are so pleased to have her join us this afternoon. Uh, take it away, Rachel. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, very much for joining us. We're excited to have the opportunity to speak with you today um, about the Nature Conservancy's Healthy Trees, Healthy Cities program. Um, and I am thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with you. Um, my director and the director of the Forest Health Protection Program will be on the line later for questions. So um, you'll have the benefit of asking both of us uh, for more information. So I'm um, going to advanced great so the slides are working so before we begin talking about our healthy trees healthy cities program I just wanted to touch on some of the um, so the goals and the successes of the nature conservancy 
The Nature Conservancy is an international organization that currently works in 50 states and in 30 countries worldwide. We have over 60 years of experience in on-the-ground conservation. And through our efforts, our science-based management efforts, we've managed to um, protect an impressive over 119 million acres of land, 5,000 miles of rivers, and we currently have over 100 marine conservation projects globally. We have about 1 million members and we have over 16,000 volunteers. And through the work that Bill Toomey and I are doing through the Healthy, C Healthy, Cities, Healthy Trees, Healthy Cities program, uh, we're looking to increase that number of volunteers even more. I have mentioned Bill. Bill is the director of the Forest Health Protection Program. Um, and I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the Forest Health Protection Program. So the Forest Health Protection Program was started in 2006. And its primary focus is to develop strategies and actions to help protect our nation's trees and forests from the major threat of non-native forest insects and diseases. There are four broad objectives, the first of which is to prevent new introductions of non-native invasive forest uh, pests and diseases, to enable early detection of these pests and diseases, to reduce the spread, and to increase, increase engagement by key constituencies. And there are three main ways that we reach these objectives, the first of which is through the Continental Dialogue on Non-Native Forest Insects and Diseases. Uh, this is a partnership of which the Nature Conservancy is only one member um, among various uh, tree care organizations, industry associations. Um, we have, we work with the Forest Service. Uh, the list goes on. So ultimately, um, it is a partnership and together we uh, develop strategies for addressing these um, non-native insects and diseases. The second key program through the Forest Health Protection Program is the Don't Move Firewood Program. I'm sure hopefully uh, the Don't Move Firewood Program has uh, reached each of you on the line in one way or the other. Those of you that work in a state urban forestry capacity uh, may be familiar with our website and the materials that we share with you. Um, you may have perhaps seen one of our billboards um, but it is a very successful campaign, outreach campaign that's reached uh, thousands of people and we actually work in 45 states. So again, big on partnerships all in an effort to try to control um, the threat of non-native uh, insects and diseases. And then the third program which I'm talking to you about today is our Healthy Trees, Healthy Cities program which addresses the health and well-being of urban forestry communities. So the vision of the Healthy Trees, Healthy Cities program is to protect the health of our nation's trees and forests and the well-being of communities by creating a culture of stewardship that engages people in the planting, care, and stewardship of urban trees and forests. And what I'd like to emphasize the culture of stewardship, um, we have a broad approach to encouraging community groups and volunteers and who, people we call our citizen scientists uh, in the management of urban trees. We truly believe that um, one of the best ways to try and prevent the spread of these pests and diseases um, and further damages is by engaging the public. And so we do our best to try to promote that culture of stewardship um, through the provision of resources, through education and outreach. Currently we are working in four pilot cities. We're working in New York City, Sorry about that, guys. Uh, we're working in New York City, in Los Angeles, in Boston, and Philadelphia, and we're currently exploring opportunities to expand in other cities um, throughout the nation. We have six key program components, the first of which is the national, national and local partnerships. Um, I already mentioned some of the partnerships that we have uh, through the Continental uh, Dialogue, and we actually also work with some of those partners through our Healthy Trees, Healthy Cities work. The second program component would be our urban forest health monitoring and tree risk assessment. Our educational resources and tools are our third component. The fourth, community-based volunteer urban forest management. Fifth, youth leadership and job training. And the sixth, our comprehensive outreach campaign. And I'm going to spend just a few minutes on each of these six components um, and we'll, we'll gladly answer more questions at the end. 
So as I mentioned, um, we have national and local partnerships, but in fact we have international partnerships as well uh, through our partnership with the International Society of Arboriculture. So just to name a few, we've got AC Trees, big shout out to you folks right there front and center. Uh, we work very closely with the Society of Municipal Arborists, um, and then we also work with the federal government. Um, we work with the USD, USDA Forest Service and APHIS, um, the National Association of State Foresters, and those of you who are from the Pennsylvania area, from the Philadelphia region, which is uh, again one of our pilot cities, you may recognize some of the icons at the bottom, and some of the logos at the bottom, uh, and that's just a handful of the partners that we have locally. Um, we have a number of partners in each of our uh, additional pilot cities. So a big thank you to the people that are on the call that represent these organizations. We couldn't do the work we do without you, so thank you very much. So the second key program component uh, is urban forest health monitoring and tree risk assessment. We ultimately do the best we can to use the most up-to-date available information and data to identify communities that are at high risk for pest infestations and diseases. And we do this through a number of uh, ways. We, as best we can, we try to secure access to um, LIDAR and satellite imagery, but then a big, a big part of what we do is use inventory data. So we've done some extensive work in Boston to try to identify high-risk communities within the Boston area. Um, and we've done that through taking um, inventory information and then also just analyzing the, um, the opportunity that pests may have given the host tree species and concentrations. So um, that's a big part of what we do. We, um, one, one thing to note is that each of the six components um, takes on a slightly different emphasis in each of our four pilot cities. Um, so a good example would be, again, tree health monitoring and tree risk assessment. Um, has factored fairly big in Boston. Um, partnerships is factoring very big in New York uh, and so forth. So the third would be our educational resources and tools. Um, we have a number of things available and I want to just emphasize this page for those of you that are engaged in um, work with your respective organizations. We are providing a number of different things. Perhaps the most important or the most useful would be our PowerPoint trainings. Uh, we've done the difficult work of pooling together lots of good information on each of the pests that will uh, potentially affect your particular locality. Um, and it's all basically designed in a presentation to be delivered by anyone with even basic knowledge of trees. So school teachers, community groups, Boy Scout leaders, you don't need to be an urban forester or an arborist to use these presentations. Fact sheets, we've got two documentaries. Um, smartphone apps, we are working directly with um, uh, staff at the University of Georgia and we were working with some other um, local pro providers of um, smartphone applications. We have internet resources, our website has most of our materials, um, and then pamphlets, fact sheets, and wallet cards. And one that I personally love is our youth, uh, our children's fact sheets. We have coloring sheets um, for kids on Asian longhorn beetle and emerald ash borer. Again, this is just an example. We were out in uh, late August. We were at the Huntington Gardens giving a presentation on um, the pests and diseases that are afflicting that area. And actually, I, having grown up in the Northeast and having studied here, I was able to take that tool and share that important information with people um, in the room, most of whom knew the trees better than I did, but was, I was still able to convey that information. In this slide, um, you probably won't be able to get the links right away, but I just wanted to um, point out that these are a series of four training videos that are available on YouTube, but even better, they're available through the OutSmart Invasives um, application, uh, smartphone application. So when you're out and you're looking for the pests and diseases mentioned here, you can click very easily, watch this two and a half minute video that will tell you what to look for uh, and just the very basic, most important information about the um, pests and diseases. So moving right along, again, as I mentioned in the very beginning, we find it critical to engage the community um, in the pursuit of better tree health and early pest detection. Um, so we do, we do focus very much on teaching people, but also in providing you, the partner organizations, with whatever it is that you need to reach your respective constituents. 
Um, youth leadership and job training. This is um, something that's obviously near and dear to my heart. Um, the Nature Conservancy has a youth-based in environmental program called Leaders in Environmental Action for the Future, which has been around since 1995. We are working directly with our LEAF staff to create and provide opportunities for these um, interns to do forest health monitoring and pest detection. And we're also focusing on providing alumni of the program additional opportunities in their respective fields uh, that will tie in with the work that we do. And the sixth would be our public outreach. Um, Don't Move Firewood is, is, as I mentioned earlier, a very successful outreach campaign. We are working very closely with Don't Move Firewood um, with our staff who actually also happen to be part of our forest health protection program. We're working very closely with, with her and with our partners to try to get our information out. Um, again, up in the upper left-hand corner, we um, did an event last year where uh, it was an outreach event in Boston and we actually our staff will wear costumes. So that is another part of what I do uh, that wasn't actually mentioned in my bio. So that's the six program components of the Healthy Trees, Healthy Cities program. Again, just to just a few points to take away. We, are, we do our best to provide you with whatever resources you need to reach your respective constituents. Uh, we are focused on our membership, focused on providing our youth with opportunities. Um, and we really do believe that the best way to prevent the spread of these non-native insects and diseases is through community engagement. So um, many of the pests and diseases that have been discovered, most notably uh, the Asian longhorn beetle outbreak in Worcester, were discovered by people in the community, not necessarily your urban foresters or arborists. So I know that I'm preaching to the converted for the most part here, but um, just wanted to let you know that we do have resources available. We're looking to support you and your efforts, and we appreciate all you do. So thank you very much, and I will open it for questions. Thank you so much, Rachel. What an excellent, excellent presentation. Um, AC Trees is thrilled to be partnering with the Nature Conservancy um, and to support the Healthy Trees, Healthy Cities uh, program um, and spread that um, all of those resources out and, you know, inform our membership of, of the great, great tools that you guys have put together um, to, to equip everybody on, on, the, on the local level to keep their urban forest healthy. So as Rachel mentioned, um, it is time to ask some questions. Um, you can type your questions in the questions bar um, on your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and while those questions come in, some of those are coming in now. Um, and we have uh, uh, one question coming in. Uh, Rachel, would you mind uh, providing some more insight into uh, what those uh, four uh, specific uh, city projects look like, uh, the ones that you um, had done in the four major metro areas? Um, maybe, maybe you can pick one of them and talk about some of the details of that project. I think it helped uh, our listeners to hear uh, what kind of an example of, of uh, a project that you've um, you've been involved with. Sure, and actually, what I will do is um, just to touch on some of the program elements in each of those each of those cities. Again, we have our six major program components, and then we also sort of have different emphases on different elements of those of, or different components of the program in each of the cities. So, as I mentioned, for example, in Boston, we worked with the Forest Service um, to do a pest assessment. Um, we had a uh, we basically tested out a, um, a technology that was designed by Dr. Greg McPherson um, to identify high-risk areas. So that was a big part of what we did last year. Um, we also have been working with LEAF schools in the community, uh, specifically the Boston Green Academy, um, which has an existing relationship with our LEAF program. Um, we did some outreach and tree planting, some educating of the students on the importance of trees and stewardship. Um, and we work very closely there. Um, we have a major emphasis on partnership building. We work very closely with the Boston Natural Areas Network. Hopefully maybe somebody's on the line here. Um, and what we, we support them through tree giveaways, um, through helping them with, um, with uh, tree planting demonstrations, and also just essentially providing them with the resources they need to try to broaden their approach to stewardship, which would include tree health monitoring and pest detection. Um, in Philadelphia, and just to, and, and I'll stop after Philly, um, 
we again work closely with the um, WB Saw School, which is also a LEAP school. Um, and we have been working with the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society to assist them um, again in tree plantings and in providing them with the resources that we need. Um, so as I said, there's we, we sort of have a tailored approach to each of the cities in which we work. Um, and we do everything from behind the scenes work to down um, on the ground, literally with the shovels in the ground. And we're excited to, I'm excited to be partnering with Joanna today because we actually uh, worked with Corterra for a major tree planting that they were able to do uh, this past fall. Wonderful. It looks like we have another uh, few questions uh, coming in here. Uh, the next one we have is uh, asking, uh, what types of data analysis methods or tools um, do you use to analyze tree risk? So that's actually a great question. Um, and that's sort of a, a process that, and um, one of the program components that's ever evolving. Um, a good, for the most part in Boston, we used, um, we used tree inventory data. Um, and in LA, we're working with one of our staff there who has been, um, kind of working with a partner organization to evaluate the um, high-risk communities in a number of different ways. So I know Bill Toomey's on the line. Um, I know that he's had much more experience through the past few years um, with these particular technologies and risk assessments. So I'm not sure, Bill, if you're there, if you'd like to add some more information. But um, as always, if we can't answer those questions right now, I know he's not feeling very well at all. Um, we would definitely be happy to follow up with you by email. Yep, thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, I'm on the phone, just home with the flu, so thanks for pitch hitting and, and doing an excellent job with the presentation. Um, yeah, to answer the question, basically, um, there's several pieces of information that we need to determine, um, you know, pest risk for a particular community. Um, the inventory data, if it exists, is key, knowing what host trees, um, we have in the cities is is critical to know you know what risk um, this communities might be be in. Um, it's a matter of um, diversity, but also specific um, trees that we have have in our communities. We take that information and overlay it um, with uh, different uh, existing and potential pest risk from uh, a variety of different sources. So uh, the, the example in Boston we used um, and worked with uh, Forest Health folks from the 20 northeastern states to come up with a pest vulnerability matrix that we applied to um, community inventory data in and around Boston to determine the, the individual community's risk to the pests that were either present in the state of Massachusetts or um, have a high likelihood of affecting um, that area. So it's a, a tool that, um, as, as Rachel mentioned, Greg McPherson had put together um, for some communities in California, and the Forest Service was interested in seeing if that would be applicable to other parts of the country. So we um, used the Boston example to utilize Greg's tool and modify it for um, the Northeast. So that, that uh, methodology and that um, information exists so if, if there are different folks on the line who want to go through that analysis we um, basically put together a kind of a cookbook so anybody could really do this if they had the uh, the inventory data and um, and you know wanted to use that that US Forest Service methodology so um, I'll probably I'll stop there excellent thanks so much Bill and um, we also have another question um, about if there is a little bit more, can you go into a little bit more detail, Rachel, on your youth programming? Um, you mentioned that there, uh, that you had youth interns. Um, what, what does that program look like? Sure. So um, the Leaders in Environmental Action for the Future program uh, through the Nature Conservancy, as I mentioned, it's been around since 1996. Um, and currently the program serves um, high school interns during the summer. Um, they're taught um, various life skills, but more importantly, they're taught um, aspects of on-the-ground conservation that they can take into their future careers. 
Um, so as I mentioned, the Nature, Nature Conservancy has managed to preserve over 119 million acres of land um, in various preserves and, um, and uh, areas that the youth then have opportunity to um, do work in. So um, a good example would be the New York interns may travel to upstate New York to one of the preserves to do some conservation on the ground conservation. Um, currently, it is a summer program for high school interns. We are working right now with the LEAF program to provide opportunities either through that high school program during the summer, it's a four week program, um, or to provide opportunities with um, the alumni of those programs. And a good example would be this summer we're preparing to work with a small crew of um, interns to do some um, tree health monitoring and pest detection um, in a park. So. Um, so we're, we're exploring different opportunities. We, again, we believe very strongly in uh, providing youth the opportunity with, with conservation work to carry, again, to carry into their future careers, but also to provide them with the knowledge and um, the sense of power that they can have to actually help us uh, protect the health of these trees. Perfect. That's, that sounds like a great opportunity to engage, engage youth in empower them and introduce them to uh, the world of, of urban trees and help them uh, become like us one day. <laughs> Can I just add um, two seconds of um, additional information? Sure. So um, as, as Rachel mentioned, the, you know, we're building on an existing program that the Conservancy has put a considerable amount of um, time and, and capacity into. And the, the LEAF network is it's is it currently exists is in 11 cities and, and 25 high schools around the country. And the, the, one of the main purposes of the program is to, um, to engage and empower um, diverse urban youth and showing and provide them with opportunities to become leaders in, in the conservation field at their schools when they return from the program, um, in their neighborhoods and communities as volunteers and hopefully over time um, in kind of paid internship and full-time job capacity as, as we build that bridge from their one month uh, high school experience to, um, to a path towards an environmental career as they go through college and beyond. Awesome. And um, we also have one more uh, question before we move on to our second presenter here. Um, we have a question, uh, when are you guys moving to the Midwest to do uh, citywide projects there? It looks like um, all of your existing um, partnerships, local partnerships have been in uh, the on both coasts and uh, we have some folks in the Midwest who uh, would like to be part of that as well. So um, any sure. about that? Yeah, um, so a few of the other communities that we're working in, and some of these are more recent, um, we are working um, in Chicago now, um, kind of through a regional tree initiative that the Morton Arboretum is spearheading. So the Nature Conservancy is a lead partner in that effort that literally just got underway, you know, in the past few months. Um, and we are working in the state of Tennessee through our Tennessee chapter, um, and we've been working kind of across the state in a number of communities there. Um, and there's potential for you know other other communities on, to come online. The the nuance of the Nature Conservancy is while we have you know we're in 50 states and 35 countries, in order for Rachel and I to work you know in a community in a particular state, we need the um, the buy-in and the support of the state chapter. So that's been um, that's been not the, uh, that's been one of the um, the ways in which we have to work. So we can't just swoop in and work wherever we want. We have to work, you know, kind of in collaboration with our with our chapter network. So that's in part dictated, you know, who uh, who we work with, um, you know, early on in the program is is states that were more willing to um, experiment with uh, with a new program like this. So sure, it makes makes sense. Makes sense. Well, thank you both so much for answering these questions. For those of you who whose answer whose questions um, would put us a little over time, uh, look out for our resource list. Um, we'll have a little bit more details about that at the end of the session. Thanks again, uh, Rachel and Bill, Thanks. and 
we'll visit you back at the end of the session. Sounds good. Thanks. Our next presenter is from a uh, member, AC Trees member organization for Terra. And uh, we have Joanna Nelson de Flores joining us. Uh, welcome, Joanna. Joanna has been with Forterra for eight years, working on community-based urban forest restoration projects. She has helped build the Green City Partnership model, starting in Seattle, and now leads the Green City's team of four staff that serve six different cities around the greater Puget Sound. Joanna has a Bachelor's of Science in Natural Resource and Wildlife Biology from Washington State University. Just a little known fact, Joanna's favorite native plant is a service berry because it is versatile with pretty white flowers that are just starting to bloom now. Happy first day of spring, everyone. And of course, berries for wildlife. And Joanna joins us now. Take it away, Joanna. Hi. Um, thank you. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, I first want to thank AC, AC Trees for inviting Proterra to share with you about our Green Cities program and the approach that we're taking to battle invasive plants in our forested parks and natural areas. And I also just wanted to echo what Rachel mentioned. Um, it's fitting that Nature Conservancy and Proterra present you together um, because we did have a great opportunity to partner on a tree planting last fall. And I want to especially appreciate uh, AC Trees for bringing the two organizations together on that. So um, I wanted to also point out this image as we get started. Um, for those of you that can see, this is a little bit of what we're facing here in, the, in Seattle and some cities around the area. Um, what you're seeing is invasive plants um, English ivy is one of our um, worst invasive plants here. Um, it's growing fully up into the canopy and um, creating um, severe problems for the health of our trees. So think about this as, as we go through um, some of the elements of um, our Green Cities approach. So first off, I just wanted to mention a little bit about Forterra. We um, changed our name a few years ago, formerly known as Cascade Land Conservancy. Um, Forterra is a regional conservation and community building nonprofit. We work in several different counties across our state of Washington, um, working on various conservation projects such as land acquisition, land use policy, and we also work with a lot of different cities and towns looking at how we can manage for growth. Uh, create healthy, livable cities and places that can accommodate densities as we expect the population to grow. So that means we're looking at various features of healthy cities, such as transportation, affordable housing, community gardens, and of course, our parks. Looking at the long list of benefits that urban forests provide, um, it's the connection is easy. As we all know, um, people need healthy forests not only to provide a long list of ecosystem services, uh, but also to provide safe places to recreate and have an experience with nature right in the city. So Forterra first got started and involved in community-based urban forestry through a partnership with the city of Seattle back in 2004. This was our first partnership of its kind called the Green, excuse me, the Green Seattle Partnership. A lot of work went in initially to create the model, some of the elements which I'm going to share today. Um, and, and since, we've, we've expanded that work and now work with an additional five cities. So these are the cities that we work with um, today. And we're hoping to grow that. Um, really, the idea is that this model will um, sort of spread across our region and we can have um, good clear regional goals for um, managing our urban forest. So together, we call all these cities the Green Cities Network. Um, as a network, we provide quarterly forums, we share ideas and practices, the representatives from the various cities and other partner nonprofits get together. Um, we share trainings and best management practices, tools for managing our programs so that we're not constantly reinventing the wheel. 
I do want to point out that these are true partnerships. Um, and I'm going to use the word we a lot. Um, and that generally refers to the partnership as a whole, the cities that we're working with, again, other nonprofits, um, and, and the work that we're doing collectively. So each of these cities is fully invested in their forest, and each have um, great internal staff that are champions, which is really, really essential to making these, these programs work. Um, these cities combined last year uh, totaled about 115,000 volunteer hours towards urban forest restoration. So to give you a little bit of background, um, I'm sure this is actually a similar scenario that is being seen across um, the country and, and probably across um, internationally as well. But here in the Pacific Northwest, we have a severe problem in our urban areas with invasive plants, such as blackberry um, and English ivy. We also, in our cities, have an aging canopy of um, more short-lived deciduous trees, such as big leaf maple and alder. And as those trees age and come down and the invasive plants um, take over, we're not having that re natural regeneration. And so what we're looking at over the course of 50 to 100 years is a scenario where we're sort of left with blank hillsides and we lose all those trees in our natural areas. And when we lose all those trees, we lose all those benefits that those trees provide um, to all of us as residents in a city. Um, we do know that we can reverse the trend, and we do know from years and years of work by volunteers and uh, lots of groups that have been you know, coming up with the best way to approach and tackle invasive plants, that we can reverse that trend through um, invasive removal, followed by planting, maintenance, care, um, and long-term monitoring. And we know that we can protect and restore these forests that will continue to provide the city with um, billions of dollars of annually of, of, of benefits. So each city has um, their distinct vision and goals, but collectively we're all working to create healthy, livable cities with sustainable urban forests and natural areas. This program is just as much about people and quality of life as it is about trees. As, as you guys know, this, in this field, the two go hand in hand. Our goal is to improve the overall health of the urban forests and natural areas. And, and to do this, we've created community-based restoration programs. Um, so our goal is to make sure that we are, are creating an informed and involved active community around um, our forested parks and natural areas. And because maintenance is so key, um, we need to make sure that we're ensuring that we create a sustainable program that will last into the future. So I'm going to go over a few elements that we use um, for planning and implementation. And um, it's hard to condense um, all, the, all the elements into a short presentation, but I do want to um, touch on a few key components that you know, really could be applied to um, any city and also any similar type of program. It doesn't necessarily have to be about invasive plant removal. So the first step, when we start with a new city, it would be tempting to just find the biggest patch of blackberry dive in. Um, but before we grab our loppers, um, we know that it's important to get to know the forest and, and figure out what is the current state of the forest? How bad is it? Where should we be prioritizing work? So our first step is really to map out the natural areas. Um, we send someone into the field to do a rapid assessment. Um, and we collect some data. With that data um, and information, we can essentially plug each park area into one of nine different categories. And on this, this matrix, which we call the triage model, some of you may have seen before, um, on, on the side, we have um, the forest value. And that's really going to differ depending on where you're at. But here around Seattle, um, you know, the very high level forest and high value forest is an evergreen conifer forest. Um, but that, again, might differ depending on where you are. 
Um, our low levels, our low value forest is an old dying canopy and invasive um, trees such as holly or laurel that are rampant within our forest. On the bottom, across the bottom from, you'll see is invasive threat. So we have low invasive threat, really general categories from about zero to 5%, um, five to 50% in the middle and 50% and up. And just to give you an idea, um, in Seattle, I believe it's more than 50% of all the acreage um, has 50% or more invasive cover. So this sort of gives us a picture of the different sort of states that the forests are in. And you can see up at the top, I can move my cursor over there, that's our highest value forest with the highest amount of invasive threat. And so that's really something we want to know. We want to know where those areas are so that we can um, perhaps tackle those first. So we apply this then um, across the city. So this, um, the matrix here with the different colors shows an example taken from the city of Everett where the, they have 354 acres total and we've classified them all here. So we know that we have about 153 acres that are medium value, medium threat. Okay, that's not so bad. And then we have um, also quite a few acres that have very high value trees, um, conifer trees in this case. Um, but over here on the far corner, we have 30 acres um, that have a lot of invasives. So again, looking at, this sort of gives you a snapshot of, of the state of each um, area within the city. I just wanted to back up and show that we also apply this on a, a park scale. So once we have this information, we create maps and we can then see the various areas that we should be working in each park. So once we have, once we know sort of the state of the forest, the next piece to uh, the analysis is really looking at um, the financial resources. And um, we want to get a snapshot of, of what is the current capacity and, and future capacity to support uh, restoration efforts. Um, so this is a combination of, you know, philanthropy, um, city budgets, and, um, and donations. Um, and then in addition to that, it's important to know uh, what your community capacity is and what are the resources available um, that your community can support. Because this is an additional leverage um, to the financial commitment that would be needed to tackle uh, a citywide restoration program. So once you have the, you know, the state of your forest and you know your current financial and community capacity, um, we work with the cities to put together a plan and to set some goals. So we essentially plug each acre out of that triage matrix into an estimated cost structure. Um, and this gives us a gross calculation, um, but it does get us right in the ballpark. So for each triage category, we have an estimated cost per acre. We times that by the number of acres in each of those categories. We also then calculate the estimated number of volunteer hours based on the triage category. Um, and so this gives us an idea of how much volunteer hours are needed in addition to um, the cost. I will point out that the cost that we um, Calculate also assume program staff and crew needs to do things that volunteers can't do, um, such as herbicide application or steep slope. We then uh, factor in the um, we then factor in the community capacity, how much volunteers are active now, um, what sort of funding and staffing there is to support the efforts. Um, we use this information to set annual ben benchmarks restoration and volunteer goals and those slowly ramp up over time so depending on what your um, your timeline is um, you would sort of spread out that that need over across time and for us we use 20 years as our model um, the example here is down below you'll see the friendly little person saying I love Everett um, we calculated that if every resident in Everett volunteered just two hours 
um, towards restoring 354 acres, um, we could reach our goal. So we know that we need about 225,000 hours to get all of those acres into restoration. And, and it, it really seems manageable when you can put it, put it that way if every resident volunteered once. An important, um, we will always need resources um, to support restoration crews, to do some of the more technical aspects of restoration. Um, we wouldn't be successful without our volunteers. And um, our volunteers serve as backbone for each partnership. In some cases, we have active groups ready to start in their parks when we start a, a new green city. In other cases, we're starting from scratch. So we use, uh, three basic steps, which is to recruit uh, volunteers. You want to make sure that we train volunteers and retain them. So um, each city has its own steward program. Could be habitat steward, forest steward. They're um, similar, but each unique. Um, and and for, those pro for those programs, we're looking to recruit uh, a leader for each forest restoration project in their neighborhood park. So these are the superstar dedicated volunteers the ones that uh, might be spending 10, 15, sometimes upwards to 30, 40 hours a month in their parks. They're, they're really amazing, dedicated volunteers. Um, and so we recruit these folks to become leaders and essentially take on a lot of the planning um, and, and managing of other volunteers that come work on their projects. Um, we establish really clear protocols um, for the program, for the for the steward program and provide training so that we can feel confident and so that they can feel confident leading other um, volunteers in the field. Um, we work with each city to establish approved best management practices for restoration. A lot of these best management practices are available online. Um, uh, it, again, it's going to be unique for each city depending on what types of invasives you're battling. Um, but in short, we have a pretty um, simple process which involves initial invasive removal followed by maintenance, weeding, planting. Um, after we do planting, we also invest a, a good number of years in plant establishment, making sure they're watered if they need it, have the right mulch. Again, more weeding to make sure that we don't revert back to where we started. Um, and then, um, the last phase of restoration is a long-term maintenance and monitoring phase, which is, will stay in forever. We'll always need to keep track of these areas. Um, in addition to trainings, which a lot of these resources are online that I can, um, on our Fort Hare website, um, we also try to make sure that we retain our, our volunteers through you know, appreciation events, making sure they have the tools and materials they need, um, access to networking. And a lot of these people are really in it for the community building sake and um, they get a lot of satisfaction from the program. One of the big reasons why these programs are still alive and running, even during tough budget seasons, is that the programs are set up to measure and track progress we are making towards the goals in our 20-year plan. We are showing progress that can demonstrate to potential funders and decision makers that these programs really work. It also helps for the retention piece of our volunteers. We see progress and know that the work that they're um, doing is being tracked and, and that there's a plan to maintain it. There's many of us have been at volunteer events where you spend three hours ripping out blackberry or ivy and you wonder, is this just going to grow back? And we make sure that we have a plan to make sure that those efforts um, are carried on into the future. So. All of our, we have a standardized um, work log that we use. Um, all of our contractors, volunteers, and staff use that same work log for recording all of the work. And so we can now, um, with an online system that we have that's been working really well, we can get a lot of real-time data that we need when a council member calls up and says, how many acres do you have in restoration? And we can get them that number. So last, I just wanted to sort of summarize here some of the different services that um, Forterra works with our various cities on, and um, and again some of those different pieces to the program. And um, 
I won't, wasn't able to dive into all of these, but just wanted to kind of give you a, a snapshot and summary of, of the, the approach, and I welcome any questions um, that you guys might have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joanna. And as uh, as always, uh, type in your questions in the in the questions box. And just to start us off, um, we had a quick question about uh, your initial forest assessment um, in the matrix that you use. Is that based on certain data points? Do you think that it would be easily transferable to um, a different climate? Um, like maybe in the south or in the northern plains? Um, or is that specific to <clears throat> the greater Seattle and, and Puget Sound region? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, similar to all evaluation pieces, it has evolved a little bit over time, but we have now established um, a tool that will be available shortly. Um, it's called the Forest landscape assessment tool. Um, so we call it the flat assessment and it would definitely be applicable um, to, to other types of habitat types. Um, it is, um, it's an estimate of ecological conditions, um, a visual estimate of ecological conditions. So we're not out there, um, this isn't a, it's a pretty gross analysis but gives us that information that we need. Um, and when we're spanning a very large area, so for example, um, sometimes three to four hundred acres on a smaller city, we have other cities that are one or two thousand acres. Um, it is a rapid assessment, and um, and so we're not setting up test plots for this particular assessment. Um, but we do get a lot of really great information about invasive cover, um, canopy cover. Um, and also some um, health problems that may be observed in some of the trees, such as root rot, um, whether there's bare soil, which shows us whether there's planting potential, um, and a variety of other attributes. So um, whoever asked that question, even though it's not available online yet, it will be um, probably in the next few months as it's just getting finalized for publication. Um, you could email me. Um, my email is up here and, and we could get that to you. Wonderful. It looks like we're also getting some questions in surrounding volunteers. Uh, you mentioned um, the importance and um, the success you've had in recruiting and um, retaining volunteers, which is, of course, definitely both very, very important um, and integral to your success. Um, do you have any specific methods of recruiting and uh, methods of retaining volunteers that you fa have found that have been very successful? Um, we probably don't have the magic silver bullet. <laughs> um, and in some cases, I'll say Seattle initially was very successful just because it, we have an amazing support people in Seattle love to volunteer, you host it, and they come. It's, it's really um, quite amazing. Um, but as far as the, the initial um, four stewards, I would say, are really key. So when we invest first in um, that person that is sort of the representative and the champion for their park, um, they are then talking about it to all of their friends, all of their neighbors. And we've really found that word of mouth um, is really our best recruitment tool. And so if we know and we support and treat those forest stewards like gold, um, we know that, that they're gonna be happy and that they are going to speak good about the program. And people really enjoy volunteering um, with our forest stewards because you know it feels more grassroots. It's, it's, it's community organized and they get to know their neighbors and they get to, um, do this all while spending some time outside. So um, as far as retention goes, some of the things for um, our forest stewards um, are that I guess I want to point out, and a lot of people know this, but you know, volunteers aren't free. And so we really, the programs fortunately, have been able to invest in having a good support system for them. Um, we have several people, the largest program is Seattle. There are several people that um, 
our supports for over 120 or 30 foresters, I believe we have right now. And so they're constantly, there's just like a hotline, people calling in with questions and, you know, things that they want to do in their parks, and they're really excited about it. So we try and keep them excited and, and, and support them and, and, you know, get them the resources that they need. Um, and then again, also, you know, appreciation events and things like that, that um, start to build community within those leaders. Um, and then they really tend to take care of a lot of the, um, what we call either regular volunteers or one-time volunteers, you know, the corporate groups or the, um, the school groups that might come out just once a year. Um, and so they're building those relationships, which um, sort of a cascading leadership model, which I think works really well. I will also mention that in addition, we, um, as partnership, um, sometimes the cities are contracting out um, additional resources to support uh, volunteer events through other groups that specialize in that. So here locally, we have a group called Earth Corps, and they um, are really great at doing volunteer recruitment. They specialize in that, and you know they bring out a lot of uh, volunteers annually to the program. Great, great, wonderful uh, feedback. Thank you so much for answering those questions. I'm going to go ahead and just open it up, uh, open up the floor again to Rachel as well. Um, if you have questions that would uh, go ahead and apply to both presenters. Um, we just have one final question um, that's applicable to both. Um, do either of you uh, engage in projects where uh, you have done a planting project or you've done a pest treatment or invasive removal um, activity and side by side uh, next to another plot of land that has not been treated um, or uh, planted on or um, cleaned up. Um, and do you have any of those kind of side by side examples to kind of support your work? Um, has, have either of you had experiences with that? Um, I could, I think it's going to be very different for um, pest management um, versus uh, invasive plant um, management. But yeah, we definitely, I mean, that's one of the great things I think that also helps retain volunteers is people can see it visually, the rewards and the difference, you know, when we're going through and removing, um, you know, a half acre of invasive plants. There's literally a line, you know, drawn on the on the property that says this is where we stop, and you you always got to kind of um, battle against that 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 line and make sure um, and whether it's private property or just a additional piece of the park, um, but you can you can see side by side right there the difference, um, and also um, over time, of course, it takes a good 10, 15 years for the new trees to really start to grow through and, and, and so you can see them, but we do have projects where um, that were started before this partnership where, you know, we have a huge trees growing where there, there weren't any before. And I think that there's a really good before and after effect there. Um, I do also just want to point out that we do have some an additional programs similar to other organizations where we're working with um, to promote uh, good practices on private land as well, because that's one of the issues that we'll run up against even once we get all the park areas and restoration um we'll still always be fighting invasive um invasion from private property and just to add a quick answer to that question um one of the things that we have noticed through our work with um, the boston natural areas network which is a partner uh, they do twice a year they do tree giveaways and there's nothing better to motivate neighbors and people who otherwise wouldn't be planting a tree than uh, a, trans, a tree on your neighbor's property. So uh, it's a little bit, as, as Joanna mentioned, it's a little bit harder for us because we have to do a lot of work to try to get people um, to build awareness about the importance of citizen involvement in pest detection efforts. Um, and so we do not yet have, well, and I'm not sure that we will have an experience where we're working in one area and not in another because as many of you know, pest detection has to be in a broad, um, a, a broad geographic area. But again, we do, um, it has been the case where people who see their neighbors 
or other you know people within their communities volunteering and and that sort of works as a the catalyst for people's own involvement great wonderful well thank you uh thanks to both um rachel and joanna for being part of the ac trees webcast series and showing us how can how we can manage pests and um combat invasive species uh, for healthier urban forests. Um, this session has been recorded and will be posted on AC Tree's website on the webcast page, that page that you clicked through to register um, in one week. And if you could please take a minute, a few minutes to complete the brief survey that pops up um, at the close of this session, we would really appreciate your feedback. Thanks to everyone who participated and attended this session. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on our next session next month, April 17th, where we will discuss operating successful mini grant programs to improve community forests. Have a great day, everyone, and happy spring. <laughs>